Hello everyone, so today we are going to be looking at the factors affecting the accuracy of eyewitness testimony anxiety. I am following along with the AQA psychology textbook for A level year one and AS with the green haired girl on. So the things you need to know and be able to recognise. I've included your specification point, so that is factors affecting the accuracy of eyewitness testimony anxiety. Now, if you had the phrasing of a question that said factors affecting eyewitness testimony, just like that, or something about factors, this relates to your misleading information spread that we've previously looked at in another video and the anxiety spread. So unless it specifically asks for one, you can mention both. So the effects of anxiety. What is anxiety? So this is a state of physical and emotional arousal. So the emotions include having worried thoughts and feelings of tension. And there's also physical changes, including an increased heart rate and sweatiness. And anxiety is a normal reaction to stressful situations, but it can affect the accuracy and detail of eyewitness testimony accounts. It's not clear also whether anxiety makes eyewitness recall better or worse, because we've got research that we're going to look at that supports both possibilities. So here we're going to look at anxiety having a negative effect on recall. So this is Johnson and Scott of 1976. So what they did is led participants to believe they were taking part in a lab study. So they had participants seating in a waiting area and while they were seated in a waiting area, participants heard an argument in the next room. So there's two different conditions here. We have a low anxiety condition and a high anxiety condition. So in the low anxiety condition, a man walked through the waiting area carrying a pen with ink on his hands. In the high anxiety condition, participants heard the same argument, but it was also accompanied by the sound of breaking glass. And a man walked out of the room holding a paper knife covered in blood. So then the, later on, the participants had to pick out the man from a set of 50 photos. Now, 49% of the participants who had seen the man carrying the pen with the ink on were able to identify him. But for the participants who had been in that high anxiety condition, who had seen the man holding a blood covered knife, only 33% could identify him. We've got a new term here, and that's called tunnel theory. And what that is, is witnesses' attention narrows to focus on a weapon, as it is a source of anxiety. So what we could say here is that the reason why participants couldn't identify the man holding the knife was because the witnesses who were seated in that waiting area, their attention focused on the weapon, which was the knife. So it didn't see the face. They didn't see the face. The alternative is that anxiety has a positive effect on recall. So this is you and Kutzel, 1986, and they conducted a study of a real life shooting in a gun shop. So the shop owner shot a thief dead and there were 21 witnesses and 13 agreed to take part in this study. So the incident had happened and then 13 agreed to take part in the study that Yule and Kutzel decided to then conduct. So the interviews were held four to five months afterwards. So that is the interviews that Yule and Kutzel were doing compared with the original police interviews, which were made at the time of the shooting. And accuracy was determined by the number of details reported in each account. So the witnesses had to report how stressed they were feeling at the time of the event, and they had to use a seven point scale to do this. They were also asked if they'd had any emotional problems since the event, such as sleeplessness. And the witnesses were very accurate in their account. So they originally had the police interviews, and then four to five months later, they had these interviews by Yule and Kutzel, and their accounts were very similar. So there was little change in the accuracy of their eyewitness accounts after five months. So the participants who reported the highest level of stress were actually the most accurate. They were 88% accurate compared to 75% for the less stressed group. Explaining the contradictory findings. So we know that anxiety has had a negative effect on recall in the Johnson and Scott study, but it has had a positive effect on recall in the Yule and Kutzel study. 
So Yerkes and Dodson in 1908 put forward the Yerkes Dodson law. And this is the relationship between emotional arousal and performance. And if you look to the right of the screen, it looks like an inverted U. Now, Defenbacher in 1983 applies the Yerkes Dodson law to eyewitness testimony. Lower levels of anxiety produce lower levels of recall accurately. So if you look low levels of performance and low levels of arousal, your performance is worse. So what there is, is there's this optimal point, which is in the middle of the inverted U, and that points to where we are at our best, the maximum accuracy. Now, if an eyewitness experiences more arousal than that optimal level, their performance starts to decline and their recall of events is worse. We will now have a look at your evaluation points. So this is your AO3 marks. So we've firstly got a limitation. This is the weapon focus effect may not be relevant. So Johnson and Scott's study may actually test surprise and not anxiety. So they think they're testing anxiety, but actually participants may focus on the weapon because they are surprised rather than anxious. So another study was Pickle 1998 who conducted an experiment using scissors, a handgun, a wallet and a raw chicken as the handheld items used in a hair salon. And scissors would be low anxiety because that's low unusualness. You expect to see scissors in a hair salon. So when we think of the Johnson and Scott study, they were in a waiting room. It might be testing surprise because the participants are not expecting to see a knife in a waiting area as they're waiting to go into a study. So it might just be that it's unusual. An eyewitness testimony was poorer in the high unusualness conditions in the study by Pickle. So that's where they had the chicken and the hangar. It was poorer because people were focusing on those objects like, oh, that's a bit unusual, which suggests the weapon focus effect, which is where you direct all your attention towards a weapon, may be due to unusualness rather than the anxiety and threat. So weapon focus therefore tells us nothing about the effects of anxiety on eyewitness testimony. A further limitation is that field studies sometimes lack control. So researchers usually interview real life eyewitnesses sometime after the event. If you think of the researchers Yule and Kutzel, they were interviewing the people who'd experienced that real life crime five months after the original police interviews. And then during that time, many different things will have happened to the eyewitness. So the researcher has absolutely no control over anything that happens to those participants, such as the discussions that they have with other people about the event, as well as accounts they may have read in newspapers. And also they have no control over the effects of the post event discussion, which is the police officers when they do those original interviews. And this is a limitation of field research as extraneous variables may be responsible for the accuracy of recall. So the effects of anxiety may be overwhelmed by these other factors, so it may be impossible to access by the time participants are interviewed. Further limitation is that there are ethical issues. So studies are trying to create anxiety in participants, and that's very risky because it is potentially unethical. You're subjecting people to psychological harm. Real life studies, therefore, are really important as psychologists don't have to create any anxiety that's already present. So it questions the need for such research where it is created when we can use real life situations. But one reason why we do create it is because the benefits may outweigh the risk if we find something significant. Further limitation is that the inverted U explanation is too simplistic. So the inverted U is only focusing on the physiological aspects of anxiety. So stress that is the physical changes to the body and brain during stressful incidents that affects the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. But anxiety is more complex than this. It's not just stress and it has many components which this theory ignores completely. So if you think we have cognitive elements also, so the way we think about an event can have a major effect on what we remember about it. So it's possible that we can think clearly about it 
even though we feel anxious and our bodies experience physical changes. So it's very simplistic, this inverted U explanation, and it may not really tell us anything. Final limitation is demand characteristics operate in lab studies of anxiety. So if you remind yourself about what demand characteristics are, these are clues or cues that the participants are using during the experiment to work out how they're expected to respond. They're trying to work out what the researcher is wanting from them in the study. Now, if participants are showed a film of a car accident, they may realise that the researcher is interested in how fast the cars are going. So this could make them respond more accurately because they want to be helpful and therefore they're going to pay more attention to that film. But we don't want them to do that. We want them to act naturally. It also could mean that they are less accurate if they're using demand characteristics because they may decide to undermine the procedure and deliberately give a different response to the one they think the researcher wants. And either way, these responses decrease the validity of the study because it's not truly measuring eyewitness testimony then, it's just measuring whether the participants can guess the hypothesis. So I've just had a look at the past papers available to you and I found this one on an A-level paper one specimen second set. It's a 16 mark question. A woman is being questioned by a police officer after a heated argument she witnessed on an evening out with friends. The argument took place in a bar and ended with a violent assault. A knife was discovered later by police in the car park of the bar. Did you see the knife the attacker was holding? asked the police officer. I'm not sure there was a knife. Yes, there probably was, replied the woman. I was so scared at the time that it's hard to remember, and my friends and I have talked about what happened so many times since that I'm almost not sure what I did say. Discuss research into two or more factors that affect the reliability of eyewitness testimony. Refer to the information above in your answer. So this is an application question. You're looking at six marks for AO1, four marks for AO2 and six marks for AO3. Now, what I'm hoping you've just spotted with this sort of question is that it doesn't say anxiety or misleading information in the question. It's looking at factors that affect the reliability of eyewitness testimony. So you're going to need to talk about both of these spreads, which is something students don't recognise always. So you need to look at the item and I would label on the side and use that space to say which bits you're going to use for misleading information, for leading questions and for anxiety. You don't have to use all three, you can just use two, but you've got a lot of information to work with there and you don't want to get confused over the different research. It also says discuss research. Now that's important because your evaluation therefore needs to link to that research. So here's your different bands. Have a little scan through those, your different levels. Look at the differences between three and four, because I find that's where most students differ in terms of their marks. So let's have a look at the mark scheme. You've got your AO1 contents. This is things that we've talked about in previous videos. And then you've got your anxiety, which is what we've looked at here. Now, this actually includes different studies to the ones we look at in our textbook. But I would suggest having a little Google of those if you fancy using them because they're just extras. But you're fine to use the ones in the textbook. Here you do have Yule and Kutzel there. And then your application. It gives very clear advice here, very clear links to the item on how you can apply. OK, because that is something that students sometimes are a little unsure of what they can talk about. But you can mention all three if you want. You can mention two. Your AO3 discussion points. Now, these may look a bit strange because they're very limited, in a sense, ethical issues, issues of validity. Now, this is because if you look at the point above the bullet points, it says will depend on research chosen, but might include. So you've got to be talking about research as your AO1 and evaluating that research in your AO3. So that is why you can talk about methodological issues, ethical issues, practical applications. And it always does say credit other relevant evaluation points that aren't on the mark scheme. Another exam question from an AS paper one from June 2017. 
Zena witnessed a violent incident. The attacker pulled out a knife and threatened the victim. Zena was close to the attacker and was very frightened and anxious. Her friend, Amanda, was further away and less anxious. The police took witness statements from both Zena and Amanda. The statements were very different. Using your knowledge of research into the effects of anxiety on eyewitness testimony, explain why Zena's and Amanda's statements are different for marks. Now, before we look at the content of this, look at the phrasing of that question. I'm hoping you can see that it is all going to be AO2 marks. It could be anything here, but that phrasing of using your knowledge of research into something, explain why, whoever, that phrasing is indicating it wants AO2 marks. It is four marks AO2. So let's look at what the mark scheme says. The mark scheme gives you possible explanations for the difference. Now, if you look at the top bullet point, it's talking about high anxiety. So that's Xena. And this leads to a decrease in accuracy compared with Amanda. So we've got some research. So you can bring in that as long as you're applying it. And that's Johnson and Scott. So if you remember, they found that those in high anxiety were less likely to accurately identify the man. Whereas if we look at the second bullet point, we've got when it, anxiety is high. So that's the case for Xena also. This leads to increased accuracy compared with Amanda. And we can use the Yule and Kutzel study, which we've looked at, where those witnesses that were close to the shooting were accurate even months later. Another question is AS paper 1 June 2017. So this followed on from Zena and Amanda. A psychologist decided to interview both Zena and Amanda five months later to see if they could still remember the same level of detail about the incident. Explain one ethical issue the psychologist must consider before interviewing Zena and Amanda. This is actually research methods. This can be thrown in anywhere all over your paper. It might be that almost a whole topic gets taken over by research methods because 33% of your paper has to be research methods across the three papers. So let's have a look at this. It's only two marks, so it's not massive. Here we've got two marks for a clear and coherent ethical issue that is relevant to the question STEM. There you are, you've got to be making it relevant. It can't just be a generic point. So here we've got protection from harm. Zena and Amanda could experience psychological harm from having to recall the details of the incident again so they could be offered counselling. That is valid. That is a very good point to make. Something along those lines. We've also got informed consent, respect and assuring their confidentiality, giving them right to withdraw. You need to be thinking about all of those. They're all your ethical things. OK, thank you for listening and best of luck with the rest of your revision.